a very highly concentrated sample, it's hard to uh, get rid of it, all right? And there's potential for memory effect. But with a heated cuvette, what that eliminates is the potential for um, condensation of mercury vapors inside, all right? So if that mercury stays in the vapor phase, we are going to flush all of that mercury out before it has a chance to condense inside of the, um, inside of the cuvette, which allows us to rapidly switch from running highly contaminated samples to samples that, let's say, have trace levels of mercury in them. So the cuvette itself, as you saw on the previous screen, all right, there's two cells. And in some of our instruments, there's actually three cells. And the mercury or the gas, uh, the vapors, are traveling through each one of those cells before they exit the system, all right? So on the graph, for any particular sample, you're actually going to see two or three peaks. And you're seeing the peak each time it goes through that particular cell. When we calibrate the instrument, which I'll show you a picture here in a couple slides, we get a regression equation. And depending upon set values or, let's say, absorbance limits for a particular cell, tells the DMA or tells the software which equation to use to calculate the concentration uh, of mercury in that particular sample. Once again, also, these peak heights, what we're seeing here, these are uh, great tools for house for, to help us identify issues, challenges, problems we're having with you know, the instrument, if we're seeing tailing, perhaps uh, subdued uh, peak height, anything like this really, really helps the troubleshooting process. All right, so as I alluded to, there are different DMA-80 configurations. And really, no matter what the configuration is, 90% of that unit is exactly the same. The difference lies in the cuvette itself, okay? So our standard uh, DMA-80, we call the dual cell or system, all right? And there, there's two cells. It has a lower limit of about 1 ppb and an upper limit of about uh, 30 ppm. And again, this dual cell really, really um, handles a very wide variety of applications. As I mentioned, it's our standard instrument. Now, if for labs that require lower levels than 1 ppb of detection, we have a tricell DNA. And we weren't very clever when we named that system. So simply, a tricell DMA has three cells in the cuvette, an even longer path length cell that gives us increased or enhanced sensitivity. In this system, we can go down into the PPT range, okay? Even 100, 200 PPT. So quite a bit lower than the standard dual cell system. On the upper limit, uh, it's still 30 ppn. Some common applications there would be, you know, pharmaceuticals, potentially food testing, uh, and definitely waters, any type of waters. The tri-cell system uh, is the way to go. I would say uh, over the last couple of years, the tri-cell system is starting to become our standard. Uh, I would say that is because of regulatory issues. You know, we are all, excuse me, all analytical labs are constantly being driven to lower and lower levels of detection. And so they need instrumentation that uh, can meet those detection challenges. The difference in price between the, dry, the tri and dual cell is minimal. So again, I think for those reasons is why the tri cell is starting to become the new norm. Finally, in those uh, applications where you're not dealing with low mercury concentrations, you're dealing with significant mercury concentrations, we have the wide range DMA. And once again, here, to get that added range, we add an additional cell and an additional detector. Uh, whenever we add a cell, we add another detector. Um, but that gives us now a higher upper range, whereas the ride range DMA-80 can go to 700 ppm. Now, I have here the lower limit of 1 ppb. And yes, the system can indeed go that low. But I think we'd all agree that if we're running uh, near percent levels of ppm, uh, sorry, <laughs> percent levels of mercury, we are going to have a, uh, a fairly significant clean-out period to go back to that low-end number, um, even for a system that has the capability of 
analyzing that wide range of, an, uh, of concentration. Okay, so from a control standpoint, there's two options. One option I would say is the most common option is our 660 controller. It's a colored touchscreen controller. It's CFR Part 11 uh, compliant. This is where we input all of our methods, uh, where we collect our data from. You can connect it to a limb system, um, et cetera. And the reason that I say that it's most common is because it's a closed loop system. We don't have to worry about the next update of Windows or anything like that, uh, which can be challenging and problematic. With that said, there is the option on, on any of those configurations of uh, DMA to also uh, use a, a PC, whether it be a, a laptop or desktop model. Okay, so calibration. One of the best things about the DMA-80 is the calibration of the unit, all right? So the DMA takes some time to switch how we think about it. But the DMA-80 actually measures an absolute amount of mercury in our sample or a weight of mercury in our sample. It does not measure concentration. It calculates concentration, okay? So because of that, when we're calibrating the instrument, we can calibrate it usually with over its entire range with two standards. And we simply increase the volume of standard being used to have a higher data point. Okay, does that make sense? I hope it does. Again, it takes some time to, to change the way we think, because so many analytical instruments do deal in concentration, but this instrument calculates concentration, all right? It takes the weight of the sample that you used and then calculates or measures the amount of nanograms of mercury in that sample and now that you have the weight and the nanograms of mercury, you can ca calculate the concentration uh, of mercury in that sample. I'm going to touch on another key feature here with the DMA, and that's the auto blank feature. Okay, so with the auto blank feature, it's it's a it's all there for being a, a user friendly feature. A user defines the upper and lower cleaning limits. All right. If you ever run a sample or have a value that exceeds your upper limit, the system will automatically clean itself until it records a blank value below the lower limit that you set. Okay? It won't inject another sample until, that's, um, until the system has been sufficiently cleaned. All right? So this virtually eliminates the memory effect. It does it automatically for you. So the DMA or drug mercury analysis for that matter does um, minimize, eliminate reagents like I said before and really has minimal consumables but there are a few. One of those are going to be the, the sample boats themselves and there are two um, types of material for boats, either nickel or quartz. Now nickel boats are standard and they're the ones that are most commonly used because they are um, specifically for doing solid samples, okay? There's no issue uh, running any types of solids and nickel boats. The quartz boats are available because whenever we're running an acidified sample, which waters, liquids are always acidified, we want to use quartz. And quartz is an inert material so that we don't have to um, worry about an acidified sample reacting with the boat itself, potentially volatilizing some mercury. Now, of course, of course quartz can be used for solids as well, um, but they're specifically there for, for liquids. They'd be used for calibrating the instrument, for example. Another consumable is going to be that catalyst tube as well as the amalgamator. Okay. So what that catalyst tube does, as we mentioned before, it's reducing all mercury forms to elemental, to their elemental state. But that catalyst tube is also there to entrap uh, impurities. Okay? So over time, eventually, um, for lack of a better word, the catalyst is going to get clogged. Right? Those binding sites are not going to be available any longer, and it's going to be, uh, need to be changed out. 
the amalgamator, same thing. Now, the amalgamator, you know, it's not just gold uh, beads that are in there. They're specifically de designed the surface area of those beads and so forth. They're very important for how those, um, those beads both trap mercury and how they release it and how they do it reproducibly as well as the lifetime on them. So there's a lot of engineering that actually went just into those beads in the amalgamator. But as you can imagine, that needs to be changed out as well. More often than not, we recommend customers, when one is changed, change both of them. All right, it will simply save time and energy, not trying to isolate which is causing the issues or the problems, simply change both out. When do you know both uh, are ready to be changed? It all comes back to, um, you know, certainly data quality, reproducibility, uh, your ability to recover uh, from uh, running a highly contaminated sample potentially, your ability to reach a low and stable baseline. These are all indications when those consumables uh, might need to be replaced. Replacing them uh, also very much depends on the type of samples that you're running and the concentration of mercury within those samples. But I would say as a generic answer, let's say, or as a rule of thumb, uh, most labs change out these consumables that I'm talking about, uh, specifically the catalyst tube and the amalgamator, about once per year. Finally, from a consumable uh, standpoint, there is a mercury trap. So those vapors do need to get uh, evacuated or exhausted from the DMA in, uh, in some way, shape, or form. And there's two ways of exhausting the unit. One is that you can exhaust it to a fume hood or some type of external exhaust. But I don't know if I've actually seen a user do it in that way yet because these mercury traps are so simple. You simply attach this mercury trap to the back of the DMA-80. The exhaust, uh, those mercury vapors go through this activated carbon. They're trapped, and now you're good to go. These uh, mercury traps, in terms of changing them out, we recommend after every other change of the amalgamator and catalyst tube. So maybe once a year, every 18 months, something in that range. A couple accessories uh, for the DMA-80. I mentioned before, uh, we need a carrier gas in the system. Often it's oxygen that's being used, but air can also be used, okay? And there's actually an air compressor for the DMA-80. So we eliminate the need for uh, compressed air, compressed oxygen can canisters. We can generate our own, all right? So that eliminates cost of those uh, components, but also makes the uh, unit um, a little bit more mobile. Uh, we've had customers that actually will take the unit in a U-Haul, for example, or set it up in a trailer at an external site uh, to do immediate analysis of mercury. Uh, usually it's in some type of uh, contaminated or reclamation site, all right? This uh, compressed air, or sorry, this air compressor really uh, makes that process or that setup uh, much, much easier. The DMA-80 can also analyze not only liquids and solids, it also does gas. And it does it in a very, very um, clever and very, very easy way. And that's through the use of sorbent tubes. And we see these sorbent tubes here, okay? So inside of these quartz sorbent tubes, there, there's a proprietary material called Add So Quick. And basically what we do is that we take a mass flow controller and connect this controller to our gas source. Uh, compressed cylinder, uh, a Tedler bag, anything like that. And that mass flow controller measures the amount of gas that passes over these sorbent tubes, all right? The volume of gas. Once we know that volume of gas, we can put that into the controller, into the software, the DMA, and then take that sorbent tube and put it directly on uh, the auto sampler of the system. All right, you don't need to change it, you don't need to break it out or anything like that. You just directly put it on uh, the auto sampler and it gets introduced in the system and ran like any other sample. A couple different setups here for uh, doing these sorbent traps. As I mentioned, you can put them directly onto uh, a compressed cylinder of some kind with a mass flow controller that is then connected to the sorbent trap. 
As you see, there's two Zorban traps here, and that's important. So the first Zorban trap there is to collect your mercury. The second Zorban trap is to simply ensure that no mercury has escaped, right? That second Zorban trap needs to be analyzed, but it should be analyzed as a blank. If there is indeed mercury in there, it means that you lost some mercury, okay, and most likely should run that test again. You can do that by adding an additional Zorbin tube. So instead of two, now you would put three uh, there for collection of your mercury. You can also do non-compressed or, or gas bags, tether bags. Once again, you're going to be hooking these bags up to the mass flow controller and the Zorbin tubes. But here you're going to have a vacuum. And this vacuum is going to pull the gas sample out of the bag through the mass flow controller and on to the Zorbin tube. So again, it's a, a pretty clever uh, way of analyzing gases and, again, further expands the capabilities of the system. Okay, so we do have some data here. Now, of course, this data uh, is going to fall. These are all SRMs, and they all fall within the range, the certified uh, range. Really, the purpose of this slide is to show you the diversity in sample types that you can do with direct mercury analysis, okay? Really, any, almost any solid that is there that you want to um, see mercury in, you can analyze on the DMA-80. Here's some specific uh, data for the analysis of fish tissue. And what this slide here, the data here shows is that data is as good, if not better, than traditional techniques for analyzing mercury, cold vapor, AA, and ICPMS, okay? both for reference materials as well as unknowns. Now, interestingly enough, there are times where uh, we've had customers say, we get higher mercury values than the certified reference material, or we get higher values than we have previously on our actual samples, but the data is very, very, very reproducible. And that's a very interesting thing, but most likely uh, what that is is that prior to doing it on the DMA, due to the sample prep or the sample handling process uh, of the analysis, mercury was being lost, okay? Here, because we're simply putting it in a boat and analyzing it directly, there's very little uh, potential for loss uh, on direct mercury analysis. Another example here, this time using the wide range DMA, and this was on copper ore samples. Now, in mining and these types of applications, we can uh, come into conditions where there are very, very, very high concentrations of mercury. PPM, even percent levels of mercury. As you can see here, we calibrated the instrument with this time uh, four standards, but it was four standards of 0.1, a 1, a 10, and a 100 PPM mercury standard. But that was over a very, very, very large range, okay? From the data that we received, though, from doing this was excellent, okay? Very, very low RSDs very, very good uh, recoveries of our standard reference materials. Now, in situations where you would have samples with mercury concentrations that exceed what the instrument is capable of doing, uh, if you don't have the wide range and you want to run a, a sample that has over 30 ppm of mercury in it, what do we need to do? Well, in that condition, we need to dilute the sample in some way, shape, or form. And what we found works best, um, oh, sorry, or very, use very, 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 very small sample sizes, one milligram, two milligrams. Yes, there's actually been instances where we do it. But certainly the, um, the chance of you getting a representative sample when you're working at such low sample sizes is pretty slim. That sample better be really, really, really homogeneous. So in these conditions, what we do is that we will dilute the sample with silica gel. We'll take one gram of sample and perhaps dilute it with nine grams of silica gel, mix it up, mix it up very, 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 very well, and then 
run the diluted sample on the DMA and back calculate to determine the concentration of mercury in that sample. Okay, we touched on this before, no sample prep, that's the primary driver, but that leads to a lot of advantages of direct mercury analysis, and one of those is going to be time. Here we compare the time it takes to analyze 250 samples, a batch, on both cold vapor as well as the DMA-80. As you can see here, it's not half as fast, twice as fast, <laughs> excuse me, okay, but it's almost twice as fast. And then when you combine this with the cost savings for labor, uh, the cost savings on reagents, the ROI is very, very, very high. It also allows you to potentially do much more samples than you could previously because it affords you the time to do so. Okay, I'm going to uh, take just a quick question here, and one of them is cleaning the boats. How do you do that? How do you handle uh, between runs cleaning the boats? So, if you are going to be uh, routinely using the DMA, and what I mean by that is that you're going to run a sample and then run a sample immediately after, you don't have to clean those boats, okay? We are, and if there's mercury left over, and we actually have a problem, right, because we want to make sure that we get all of that mercury removed from that boat during the process. So if you're going to be running them uh, immediately after or pretty close to immediately after, you can just weigh your sample into those boats once again and run them. If you aren't going to be doing that, let's say the boats are going to be sitting around for a while, there is a couple of, of options or choices. One of those is that you can uh, burn those uh, boats off in a muffle furnace, okay? So that's going to uh, volatilize any remaining mercury that's there. The other that you can do with the quartz boats, not for the nickel, but for the quartz boats, is certainly that you can do uh, an acid wash like you would other labware as well. Uh, one other question, um, well, we'll do two real quick. Does the DMA-80 need a direct connection to the hood? Uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, as I mentioned, all of our users, for all intents and purposes anyways, use that dedicated mercury trap. Uh, that's connected to the back of the system. And again, that gets changed after every other change of the consumables. Here we go. What is the main maintenance that is required on the system? Well, you know, I've, outside of just general good laboratory care, let's say, keeping the instrument uh, clean, uh, not having dust or particulate buildup on it, etc., the main maintenance on the instrument is going to be those change of consumables. Now, the first time you change the consumables, it's probably going to take about a half an hour to 45 minutes or so, just because you're figuring it out for the first time. After that, I would say that the change of consumables takes about uh, 15, maybe 20 minutes. Okay. Now, when you change the consumables, you do need to recalibrate the system, and sometimes you need to what we what we say uh, condition the catalyst to. Okay. We need to get it ready for analysis. And all that is is simply um, uh, we take some flour, all right? You, we used to do soap. We used to do, you can do any type of organic sample, but you take uh, routinely flour and run that through the system. And what happens during that process is that through the decomposition, that flour actually starts on fire, okay? And it's that fire uh, inside of the system that goes into that catalyst bed that really let's say, conditions those active sites on those mixed metal oxides, definitely removes any potential mercury that's in the system and gets it ready uh, to go. Okay, so uh, we just talked about time savings, and obviously that, lean, uh, that leads into uh, cost, right? But not just cost and time savings. Uh, you have time savings for reagents, et cetera. Here we actually laid, uh, laid it out, all right? We talked, we laid out each sample, what is the cost per sample from reagents, time, labor, et cetera. As you see from the bottom, when you put this all together, for the DMA-80, the total savings per sample per day is about $6.20 compared to cold vapor. Obviously, that depends on, uh, you know, a big factor there is going to be the 
rate at which we're paying the, the lab technician, but that's a good you know, general rule of thumb. Total savings per day, right, for doing these uh, 40 samples, uh, you can save significant values here, almost $500 in an eight-hour day you can save. Again, not every uh, environment is very, very high throughput. Not every environment has the, the ROI of a particular instrument isn't the most important thing. But for labs that are, the DMA can pay for it off itself very, very, very quickly. All right, just to, again, to finish up here with a couple case studies, all right? Um, very common environment where the DMA uh, 80 is used is in the academic environment, both for research as well as teaching. And Maggie Castellini here at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks has been using the DMA for a really long period of time. Prior to the DMA 80, uh, she used both uh, cold vapor atomic fluorescence uh, as well as uh, cold vapor atomic absorption. And again, those are really good techniques, but they're time and cost intensive. In addition to that, because this is a teaching environment, um, students, right? It's not easy for students to teach students uh, how to use that instrumentation. It's not really possible to do quick little projects on this type of equipment because the learning curve is relatively steep. When Maggie switched to the DMA-80, she realized a few things. One is it's the minimal sample processing that is required, but also the very small sample sizes that can be used, okay? Uh, Maggie is working a lot with uh, mammalian tissues, blood, uh, hair, typically things that you're not collecting a lot of sample from, okay? But the DMA-80 is very, very easy to analyze these very small quantities of sample and get good representative uh, numbers. As I alluded to a little bit there, it's not only great for research, but teaching, right? The DMA-80 really shines in teaching. In fact, we actually have several high school labs. Uh, that wasn't a high school that I went to, uh, but, but high school labs that use the DMA-80 because it's so simple to use. Uh, Undergraduates can do very, very fast research projects uh, with the DMA-80. DMA they can run 40 samples in four hours, okay, without having to be exposed to uh, corrosive acids or anything like that. So that is definitely uh, the, the teaching uh, aspect of the DMA-80 is a big value that Maggie realized. From more of an industrial approach, uh, here we have AZC. ACZ Laboratories, and ACZ is an environmental uh, laboratory based in Steamboat Springs, uh, Colorado. They do primarily mercury analysis on solids uh, for RECRA compliance monitoring, as well as bioaccumulation toxicity, toxicity studies. Prior to the DMA, they did all of their analysis, like most, on cold vapor as well as ICPMS. Now, that process of looking and purchasing in, purchasing the DMA was fairly involved, uh, but they did decide on the DMA-80 primarily for Milestone's experience. Again, being here, doing this type of technology for 25 years, uh, our support, and specifically the catalyst. Kind of made light of it in an earlier slide, the catalyst is where the magic happens, but the catalyst is really a critical point of direct mercury analysis. Uh, getting that catalyst too bright, not only to convert the mercury to uh, reduce the mercury to total mercury, but for longevity, reproducibility, et cetera, it's a really um, complex uh, piece of technology. This, I think, is a very, very important point that they realize with the DMA-80. Their detection limit dropped from 40 ppb on cold vapor to less than 1 ppb with the DMA-80. That's pretty, uh, that's pretty impressive. And since they've had the DMA, uh, they have moved most of all of their mercury analysis to the system. Uh, they did get approved through NELAC, okay? So it is possible for those environmental labs that are on here today, it is possible to get NELAC approval for the instrument. And, you know, it's really by far paid well for itself. 
uh, since they have had the instrument. Here's a partial loser list again, like the slide I, I showed you before. Just an example of the range of applications, industries, and so forth that the DMA-80 is used in. I'm not even going to talk about this slide because really, really, we really covered it throughout uh, the slides in, in today's presentation. But direct mercury analysis, the big thing is that there's no sample prep involved whatsoever. So it's fast, but the data quality can often be much, much, much better because we eliminate uh, uh, that sample handling, the, the um, acid digestion or the sample prep component of mercury analysis. I think I saw some information not so long ago, many of you probably have saw the same, or in any trace metals analysis process, the actual analytical component or the analytical step is maybe 5 or 10 percent the total time uh, uh, for a particular sample. Ninety percent of the time is through collection, sample handling, sample prep, et cetera, and that's where the errors occur. Uh, here we don't have to worry about it uh, so much. And I know we talked a lot about just uh, direct mercury analysis in general, but some of those key features, you know, what's, what's important, direct mercury analysis in itself um, is a process, but in that process, kind of what are, what are some important things uh, that Milestone developed? And that was one, that internal temperature monitoring with the thermocouple, that preheated cuvette so that we don't have any mercury condensation, we eliminate, certainly minimize any potential memory blank, memory blank. The auto blank feature is really something uh, that is user friendly, that won't introduce a sample if uh, we previously ran a sample that exceeded, exceeded an upper limit that we set. And just the flexibility of the instrument, really being able to go to very, very high concentrations of, of mercury to very, very low in all different sample types. Now, as I said, uh, all of this is going to be available to, to you post uh, WebEx. Everyone will get an information packet as well as a recording. But please visit our website. We have some case studies, more in-depth case studies uh, to the ones that I mentioned here, and just a lot of good information about mercury analysis in general, all right? And, you know, uh, if we can offer any uh, specific assistance to you, we are happy to help. Uh, we do a lot of on-site demos of this equipment. We're happy to bring an instrument to you, show you the capabilities uh, that we talked about today, or simply a conference call. Happy to discuss whether it's myself, our applications chemist here, or your regional salespeople. Happy to discuss your needs, and if direct mercury analysis or any other uh, product that Milestone offers could be a good fit. So with that being said, we are going to answer some questions here. If some come up that you think of, please include them in the Q&A box, again, in the bottom right-hand portion of your screen. And I'm going to take two or three here. This is a good question. Is the DMA-80 matrix-specific? That question comes up a lot. The idea that we're calibrating with um, liquid standards, but then analyzing solid samples on it. You know, we, a real benefit of direct mercury analysis, the DMA ADS, but really direct mercury analysis, is that it primarily is matrix independent. And it is because of the process in which uh, direct mercury analysis works. Once we thermally decompose that sample, right, once we turn it to mercury vapor, mercury vapor, whether it comes from blood, whether it comes from a polymer or soil, it's all the same. So it typically is going to react in the exact same manner within the system as it goes through the catalyst bed, as it gets collected on the amalgamator, and as it gets analyzed, it all reacts in the same manner. There are some, some very small occasions that we have found where for particular sample types, it's better to calibrate uh, with a matrix that's similar, but for 90%, if not more, of the applications out there, uh, it is matrix independent, which is a, a really nice thing to do. 
Um, how often do you have to run an SRM or CRM through the process? Well, uh, obviously it depends on if, if your uh, company has any internal uh, processes in place for how to do that or if you're following any specific or regulated guidelines. But normally I would say what we do is that every 10 samples we uh, run an SRM or a CRM, right? So we will run 10 samples, we'll run a CRM, we'll run a blank, we'll run another CRM, and we'll run 10 more samples, we'll run an SRM, et cetera. This is kind of the, the process that we found has uh, worked very, very well. Uh, here's a good question. Uh, well, does for install and training, uh, is this done on site by a service engineer or is it simply done through videos? Um, if you were to purchase a DMA-80, uh, we come on site and install, spend a full day with everyone there uh, showing how to calibrate the instrument, going through software, often running live, live samples uh, so that everyone there is comfortable uh, with the instrument. Uh, can we analyze gas samples without the absorbent? Uh, yes, it's possible, and, and to this individual, I will send some uh, more specific information. We do have a kit, a gas analysis kit, that can be installed on the DMA-80 um, that allows you to uh, run gases straight, but that involves uh, syringes and some bottles and, and basically a much more complex uh, mechanism for analyzing gas. So for simplicity's sake, we always, really almost always, go to the sorbent tubes and find a manner in which we can collect the gas um, that is needed to be analyzed on, or the mercury in that gas uh, on a sorbent tube because it's just very, very simple and, and very, very, very effective. What else do we got here? Uh, can you do uh, clinical uh, samples on the DMA-80? Uh, absolutely, specifically blood, yes, uh, no problem. Oftentimes with blood, uh, blood is one of, actually one of those samples that we do at times see a matrix effect come from. So it's no problem, uh, we can analyze them. What we do with blood is that we'll run them in quartz boats and typically we will add a little bit of uh, dilute nitric acid to the blood, all right? And what that does is we believe it breaks down some of the, the lipids, some of the fatty component of the blood that gives us uh, much better uh, data. It, it prevents um, some sticking, if you will, on the amalgamator. Again, we rarely see it, but for whatever reason, we see it on blood. So the DMA-80 can be used for it, but we do need to, to add that little step there uh, to, to make it work. Uh, another question, can the dual cell uh, be upgraded to a tri-cell uh, DMA? Yes, uh, that capability is absolutely available. Um, also, you know, I talked about the cuvette, the heated cuvette, uh, the thermocouple, et cetera, your system can also be upgraded there as well. I believe it was, I believe it was about seven or eight years ago, uh, we introduced a, a, a new cuvette that gave much better uh, detection capabilities than the earlier models, uh, almost enhanced them twofold from 0 0.05 nanograms of mercury to 0 0.0015 nanograms of mercury, so so quite a bit. And those systems as well can be upgraded with, with the new cuvette uh, for analysis. Okay, everyone, it, it's 10 after three. I apologize, I ran a little bit longer. Any questions here? Uh, I see there are more questions coming in and there's some user questions coming in as well. We will absolutely be getting in touch with you uh, personally. You also have answers to all the questions in your information packet.
really appreciate everyone's time this afternoon. I know it's busy and hard to take time away uh, to, to view these things. If there are any more questions, we'd be happy to answer it, and feel free to call us at any time. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.